Welcome back. It is time to talk about trait theory. Finally, it seems like we've been talking about a lot of um, sort of amorphous theories of personality that don't have a coherent, you know, overarching theme, you know, behaviorism and cognitive psychology. Um, it's time to finally talk about one of our three major grand theories of personality. So we talked about psychodynamic theory at the beginning. That one's one of our psychoanalytic, you know, Freudian theory, really uh, well designed, you know, really thought out, tried to explain everything. Then we kind of got bogged down in sort of these um, less well-defined theories. Now we're going to get back to a really well-defined theory of personality. The basic premise of chapter eight is that we each possess traits, qualities, um, clusters of behavior to differing degrees, and that these traits are the things that we should be measuring. So let's go ahead and jump into just sort of the history of human assumptions about traits, because <laughs> um, these are not necessarily going to be you know, coherent scientific theories that we're going to be talking about in this on this slide. So the first one I wanted to introduce is from the fourth century BC, and it was introduced by Hippocrates. I mentioned this back in the biological chapter, but what I wanted to emphasize here with his bodily humors is that he thought that there were a set of behaviors that went along with these different degrees of, of bodily humors. So even though he wouldn't have, you know, used the word trait necessarily, um, he was arguing for consistent sets of behaviors that would could be clust clustered together into traits. Theophrastus, Theophrastus, I don't know, it's a Greek name and I never know which um, syllable to put the emphasis on when I pronounce them. Theophrastus had a theory of sorts. Um, it was much more about um, characters that you would have in plays. If you recall back to, um, I think it's chapter one of our textbook, they talked about how a lot of personality theory really sort of um, began in, in the theater as, you know, people were trying to write characters that, you know, the viewers would recognize and stuff. They really were kind of tapping into traits. So back in the third century BC, he was, he was doing that. I'm going to do a little awkward transition real quick here to show you um, Theophrastus's um, characters. And so um, the key thing that I want you to notice on this page isn't necessarily what it says, but just how much it says. So here's sort of his introduction. Um, and then he's I, he's um, describing the, the traits that would be associated with these different kinds of characters. So the ironical man would have um, certain characteristics that would go along with being an ironical man or the flatterer or the garrulous man. That means a person who, who talks a lot. Um, the boor who offends people, the complacent man who's, um, you know, calculated to give pleasure, but not with the best tendencies, the reckless man, the chatty man, which for some reason is different from the garrulous man, but okay, let's go on. The gossip, again, couldn't that be under garrulousness, right? Because you're talking a lot, but it's, I guess, the topic of what you're saying, the shameless man, the penurious man. Um, so this is a person who pays too strict of attention to profit and loss. The gross man, they, uh, it's, um, ob it says it is obtrusive and objectionable pleasantry. Okay, again, all right. The unreasonable man, the officious man, the stupid man, the surly man. I wanna take a break on stupid man because um, it says defined by, as mental slowness in speech and action. So stupid doesn't necessarily mean like IQ per se, but they are slow in their speech and their action. Okay. The superstitious man, the grumbler, the distrustful man, the offensive man, the unpleasant man, the man of petty ambition, um, the mean man. Some of these sound like they're overlapping to me. The boastful man, the arrogant man, like those two seem like the same thing, but okay. The coward, the oligarch, the late learner, the evil speaker, the patron of rascals, the avaricious man. So he has, you know, a total of 30 different characters that he sort of laid out. And what's interesting, again, it's not what he wrote necessarily, but how much stuff he said about it. 
um, you know, the characteristics of the avaricious man takes two paragraphs to describe, right? Um, so that's the important thing that I want you to take away is that, you know, in the third century BC, probably because he was designing, you know, plays or something like that, he was really thinking through the different types of men that might be characterized. Um, something else that we're going to reach back to would be that we talked about before in the biological chapter would be Charles Dar Darwin and his assertion that there are individual differences. Um, the thing that he argued that was really important for trait theory is that we need to scientifically study individual differences and that he's going to say that any individual differences that emerge are going to be present because of evolutionary processes. These are going to be behaviors, um, predispositions that are somehow beneficial. And that's why they um, continue to exist in, in humans. And this is why we have individual differences, because it's somehow beneficial to our species. And then Francis Gal Galton, who we recall, is Darwin's cousin. And again, he said... Um, that there are individual differences and they can be scientifically measured, but he, um, in his perspective, was really focusing on intelligence. So a little bit different from his cousin who was just talking about, you know, Darwin, Charles Darwin was just talking about, you know, um, traits and behaviors. Francis Galton said, I want to focus in on one specific kind of trait and that's intelligence. And um, we should be able to measure these individual differences that exist. All right. Um, we're going to, again, reach back into previous chapters and talk a little bit about Carl Jung because um, he introduced the first sort of coherent description of introversion, extroversion, um, and we now consider those to be traits. So um, he talked about a typology. He thought that there were a, a small number of types of people and that these types of people are going to be... Um, defined by the, the constellation of traits that they have. Um, so each person fits into one type better than all the other types that are available. Um, he hypothesized that there were eight basic types of people. Um, those eight types of people come from a combination of four functions, he called them. And those functions are sensing, thinking, feeling, and intuiting. So these are the four basic functions of personality and then two attitudes. And those attitudes are extroversion and introversion. So sort of attitudes towards, um, you know, the exterior world or the interior world would be extroversion and introversion. Um, and then you've got these four functions of sensing. So if you combine these um, two, um, you know, the, the two attitudes and the four functions into all the constellation that they can have, you're gonna end up with eight basic types. So you've got, you know, the extroverted, sensing, extroverted thinking, extro extroverted feeling, extroverted intuiting. So that's four types of people. And then you've got the introverted, those four things. Um, most people who follow the Jungian approach would measure this, these four, I mean, these eight types with the um, Myers-Briggs type indicator. This is a scale that was created by um, a woman, her daughter, and her son-in-law. So the, really this was made up on like the kitchen table from people who had read Jungian theory and tried to design questions that would go um, after, you know, these eight basic types of people um, so that you'd be able to distinguish among um, the different types. So this is a good example of the a type of scale that was, um, you know, designed to have good construct validity. The intention was for the the scale to follow the theory. So they made up questions on purpose to try and conform to what Jung said about these eight different types of people. Um, and so if you take the Myers-Briggs type indicator and, you know, there are small versions available online that are free that aren't necessarily the official Myers-Briggs, but they can give you kind of a little bit of insight into your type. Um, but if you take it, it'll give you a series of letters as your result. So it might tell you that you're a S T N E or <laughs> things like that. I'm making something up because I've never taken the Myers Briggs. It's um, it's a paid for scale and none of the departments I've ever been in have ever paid to have the Myers Briggs type indicator, uh, which I'm kind of sad about. I teach inter, um, industrial and organizational psychology and uh, a lot of businesses 
really believe in the Myers-Briggs type indicator. They really think that that there are eight types of people and they're looking for certain types in their company. And so they will administer the Myers-Briggs and think it means something. Um, and so I would like, I, I would like to own the Myers-Briggs, but I don't, I don't have access to it. Um, now I said something that I kind of revealed there and it, uh, that, you know, they, they believe it means something. Businesses have a, the ones who use it tend to believe that it tells them something about their potential employees that would allow them to uh, make good hiring decisions or um, promotion decisions or, you know, those kinds of things. Um, there's not really a lot of evidence to support the validity of the Myers-Briggs type indicator, let alone evidence for the existence of eight types of people. Um, it's kind of a circular definition if you say, well, I mean, if you take the Myers-Briggs type indicator, you will be placed into one of eight types. And it's like, well, yeah, um, that's true because that's how the scale is designed. But does that mean that there are in fact eight types of people out in the world? Um, so using the, the MBTI to confirm Jung's theory that there are eight types when the MBTI was designed specifically to assess those eight types, and fit people into those eight types makes it a circular logic. So I, I would love to show you an example of it, but um, I'm not big on um, copyright infringement. So if you wanna Google it, you can look for yourself and, and see if you can find a version of the Myers-Briggs type indicator and see what you think of it. Um, now, Cattell, um, he used a more uh, objective way of developing his scale for assessing different personality traits. He used a technique called factor analysis. Um, so factor analysis is a really complicated statistical strategy, and especially in Cattell's day when they had to hand calculate everything. Um, I, I, I can't imagine the months that it took for them to do the computations that it took to come up with the 16 personality factors that he ultimately came up with. Um, as a graduate student, when I learned about um, factor analysis for the first time, uh, it was introduced in my second year of graduate school when they had already started to let us use um, computers to do our calculations on our statistics. And they said, you know, we would never put you through the torture of actually hand calculating factor analyses because it's such complicated math. Um, but the thing that's nice about a factor analysis is that it lets the data determine what the traits are. Instead of following a theory and making up questions on purpose to make sure that the, the traits are going to emerge, the factor analytical procedure is to generate a whole bunch of different um, kinds of questions that some people will agree with and some people will disagree with. and, and Ultimately, you use the statistics to help you to determine whether there are clusters of answers that are consistent for an individual. And so we can say, okay, those are all being answered in basically the same way. These must be a trait um, for, for all people to cluster these together and answer them in a similar way means that this must be a trait. And that's basically what factor analysis does. It's a data-driven approach rather than a theory-driven approach. So Cattell generated a bunch of different questions, administered it to thousands of people, did the factor analysis on it, and came to the conclusion that there are 16 basic trait clusters. So um, he designed um, his scale and called it the 16 PF for the 16 personality factors. Um, so he collected a lot of different types of data, which makes him unique compared to some of the other trait theorists, um, because he used questionnaire data where, you know, what we're familiar with, where you just answer questions and you make marks and stuff. He also did some experimental data to see if, you know, in certain circumstances, people would actually behave differently from each other. So given the same stimulus, the same um, circumstance, would I behave differently than you would? And why would that be? And could it be because we have different traits? And then he also did sort of this background data collection. He called it the life data, um, where he did, um, you know, he in interviewed family members and friends, and he interviewed the person to ask them about their lives and, and things like that, so that he didn't have just the questionnaire to rely on. He had these other sources of data. Um, so now, nowadays, once he's developed this and he's con come to the conclusion that these questions are tapping into these traits that through my um, 
not only the questionnaire, but also my experimental data and my life data, I am pretty confident that these are the 16 traits. He um, now has developed the 16 personality factors questionnaire, which apparently during the pandemic has become completely locked down and is only available for purchase through Pearson Publishing Company. Um, so I can't show you questions from that anymore like we used to. Um, again, it's something that a lot of times is used in business and other settings where um, they think that it'll be really important for helping them to pick the kind of employee that they want or, or promote the right type of employee for the position that they have and things like that. So um, whenever you have business starting to get involved, then publishers will lock down the um, the questionnaire and sell it. And so I, I looked it up and you can buy the 16 PF questionnaire for $130 for a hundred um, paper and pencil administrations. I think it's 500 if you're going to do online administrations. So it's not super expensive, but they don't want it floating around for free anymore. So, so we have, let's just compare our, um, MBTI Myers-Briggs to the 16 PF and just reiterate that the Myers-Briggs was developed with the theory there and then they generated questions that they thought would test the theory that would allow people to respond in ways that would reveal where they fall in that theory's predictions. It's almost like you could say the opposite was done to create the 16 PF. Um, he just generated a bunch of questions with no real um, theory guiding him, just kind of, and it, I say him, he and, you know, tons of research assistants and things who helped to generate these, um, these trait based statements, they would just generate what they thought would be a behavior. Um, you know, I like, um, I'm outgoing at parties or, um, I like to read a lot or other kinds of statements like that. And a person just agrees or disagrees with it. And that, um, being compared with how they behave in the lab and then how they say that that they've acted in the past and, and how their family and friends describe them all comes together into, um, you know, with this factor analytical um, process reveals that there are in fact 16 traits that seem to have emerged. Um, kind of, we'll call it organically, right? Sort of this is how people seem to be rather than we imposing a theory and seeing if people answer in a way that's consistent. So that's a big significant difference between these two, um, these first two theories, right? The Jungian theory and then Cattell. All right, let's go ahead and stop here and we'll talk in the next segment about um, Gordon Alport and where he went with the trait theory.